Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, or Abijah, I don't know, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord. Maybe you need to take me out of the monitor because uh, it's pointing towards me. Uh, let's start with verse 8. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you, to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until all the days of these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he wasn't able to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And, the angel, uh, and Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 
Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Our message map for today, in our message titled, John the Baptist and our mission call, to tell people the good news of the new covenant of Christmas. You see, John the Baptist bridged the gap between the old covenant and the new covenant. He was neither of the old covenant and he was really not of the new covenant. We're gonna, look, take, we're gonna unpack that today and see how John the Baptist came to realize the real meaning of Christmas. We're gonna look at, we're gonna contrast Zachariah's response to the angel and Mary's response to the angel or God's call for them to participate in miraculous births. We're going to look at John the Baptist, his calling, and his ministry likeness to the ministry of Elijah. We're going to see that John the Baptist is greater than all those naturally born of women. Jesus was unnaturally born of women. But his ministry is less than ours because he had an incomplete view of Christmas. And then we're going to look at how our call uh, models John's call to cry into the wilderness of our generation to explain the real meaning of Christmas. You with me? All right, let's look at Zacharias's response. In Luke 1, 18 through 20, Zacharias, Zacharias' response silences him, but Mary's response causes her to sing. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know? That word means, how can I believe you? You know, God rewards faith. And we get disciplined for a lack of faith. Because if we don't have faith, you can't follow God. You can't do what God wants you to do. So he goes, how can I believe this? And he gets silenced. Because he did not believe. You with me? The angel said, Behold, you will be silent and, un and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe. There's a whole message in there about witnessing. The greater your faith is, probably the better witness you will be. If you, if you don't believe, you don't have anything to say. Can we move on? Let's look at Mary's response. Mary's response causes her to sing the praises of God. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be? How will this come into existence? Since I am a virgin. She believes, but she wonders, How are you going to do this? And, and she receives the impossible. A virgin has a child. Mary's response said, says, Behold, I am the servant, the bondmaid, the female slave of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. According means let it come down from God's throne into my life. What an amazing servant's attitude. Got those? What should babies bring into the world? In God's frame of reference. Zachariah and Liz are too old to have a baby. It certainly can't be a convenient time for them to be running around chasing a two-year-old at their age. Yet, they receive God's call to have John the Baptist. God's plan is for babies to bring joy. Not to abort inconvenience pregnant, inconvenient pregnancies. We see a young woman who is unmarried and, and God impregnates her. That's a stoning charge in Israel at this time. Can you imagine the risk that, that I mean, this is how powerful God is. Think of the risk that he uh, seems to be taking here. He has an unmarried young girl. He's going to have his son born in a stable where there's all kinds of animals and potential, you know, germs and whatnot. Although I've, people that are raised on farms, they say that, you know, they, get, they don't get as sick as other people because they're exposed to everything and they develop all these immunities. 
But let's look at John the Baptist's call. You ever hear of the Nazarite call, the Nazarite vow to Numbers uh, 6, 1 through 8? For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. Samson had the same call in his life. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. At one point in, the, in, the, in, the, in Acts, Paul has taken a Nazarite vow for a period of time, so he's not going to cut his hair. It's really cool in Numbers 6, 1 through 10. You can go read those and see all the neat things that... Um, God makes a provision for in there. And even if you uh, stumble and make a mistake, in verse 9, it says, if any man dies very suddenly beside him, like you can't touch a dead body or be around a dead body when you're uh, in proximity to a dead body when you're taking a Nazarite vow. And God even makes a provision that if you're suddenly ne near someone, uh, standing next to someone who has a heart attack or something, God lets you make atonement so you can get back onto your, you know, keeping your vow. But the important thing about John is he will have a ministry of reconciliation through the calling of people to repentance. You can't get reconciled to God unless you repent. There's some really, really cool things I discovered by studying these scriptures. I'm going to share them with you. 2 Corinthians 5, 18-20 says, We are ambassadors. John was an ambassador with the ministry of reconciliation. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Colossians 1.22 explains that reconciliation has, uh, what, what reconciliation has done for us. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy, unblemished, and blameless in his presence. I don't think John the Baptist figured that one out. That when he says, behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God, I don't think he realized what that really meant what God was planning on doing to that lamb. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, back to John's call, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. You know how John turned people's hearts back to God? He stared down the prophets of Baal, who were under the, on the payroll of the king and the queen. He dissed the people that were on the payroll of the king and the queen. Matthew Henry says this about John going forth in the spirit and power of, of Elijah. Now, if you read the um, King James, sometimes, sometimes they call Elijah Elias. First, John the Baptist, like Elijah or Elias, will preach the necessity of repentance and reformation. You know how I always say America needs a reformation that calls us back to God and to, and to the, and to the um, information that is in our founding documents. Our founding documents show that the founding fathers made the best, that God worked through them to make the best possible human system of government to deal with sinful man who would be in control of government. So because John the Baptist, like Elijah, Elijah preached to Ahab and Jezebel. You know, when you think about wicked people in the Bible, I mean, Jezebel's kind of like, she's got to make the top five, right? <laughs> and so, and, and you think about Herod. So you have Elijah, you know, preaching truth to Ahab and Jezebel. And then you have John the Baptist preaching God's truth to Herod. Um, a, a, guy, a, pro, a guy who told me he was a prophet contacted me on Facebook the other, uh, yesterday. I haven't had a chance to respond to him, but I'm going to say, I'll give you something to prophesy to. Come with me. Let's go do this together. By the way, family life the, found, the foundation, the building block of society is so important to God and for his purposes for society that he sends his prophets to confront evil at the highest level of society. For God knows that when sin is prominent there, it tends to trickle down and encourage the corruption of the masses. 
Both John the Baptist and Elijah were carried on in their work by a divine spirit and power, which crowned their ministry with wonderful success. The crowds flocked to John the Baptist. The crowds would have been flocking to Elijah, but the king and the queen were murdering God's real prophets. So the people were kind of afraid to come. So God's going to send Elijah to, to a thousand or so of these evil, falsely prophesying people. Elijah ministered before the writing prophets. You know, Isaiah and, uh, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We have these big books by these guys. We got a book by Hosea. But Elijah really, we only, it's only recorded in uh, 2 Chronicles 21, uh, verse 12, that he, sent, that he wrote anything, which was a letter he wrote to Ahab. I'm sorry, a letter he wrote to Jehoram, pronouncing his judgment by death by bowel disease for killing all of his brothers to become king and for leading Israel into idol worship. You know, I was talking to a guy last night and he said, well, you know, uh, when people skip church and they go out on their boats, they're worshiping idols. I'm like, no, they aren't. They're just, they bought a very expensive thing. They want to use it and have fun with their family for a Sunday. That's not idol worship. It may be disobedience, depending on what God wants them to do, but it's not idol worship. No one is ascribing to their vote, boat the values of deity. But that's what we do when we pray to Mary, right? We, or we pray to these saints. We are ascribing to them the characteristics of deity. And that's what God calls idol worship. The church has, has, has bought into this thing. Oh, everybody idol worships. I, well, I love my guitar, but I don't, my guitar, and I might even at times play it when I should be doing something else. But that, I do not ascribe the characteristics of deity to that guitar. I'm not worshiping that guitar. I'm not praying to it. I may be, when I was younger especially, I may be overbalanced at times in my desire to play it and when I should be playing it, etc. But I'm not worshiping my guitar. God isn't overthrowing nations because you worship your, because you play your guitar too much or you get on your boat too much. He's overthrowing nations because you are, ascri you are ascribing the characteristics of deity to things that are not God. No cop-outs here. We need to call idols what God calls idols and don't let these people slide because God is judging this nation and we need to be called to repentance. Anyway, if you read 2 Chronicles 21, verses 16 through 20, you'll see the amazing punishment that God brings on Joram. Now, here's what I really want to talk about today. Both the prophets Elijah and John the Baptist knew that God was righteous and holy and that there existed a gap between our behavior and in God's character, his holy character. So they preached repentance. John the Baptist also was given a message of baptism as a symbol of the demarcation point in our life that divides how we were before we responded appropriately to God's law and how we are after we respond appropriately to God's law. Baptism is a symbol that I've made a decision. Prior to this, I was thinking all these things and doing these things. After this, I'm going to think these things and do different things. May not do them perfectly, but baptism is a symbol that I'm making a break with the past. I'm going to bury it under that water and I'm going to resurrect it to new life. John the Baptist is the only prophet given that particular ministry. What's happening here? What was John the Baptist's view of what was happening here of this Christmas time? What did he think the coming of Christ was all about? What would it really mean to the world? His perception was on target in many ways. For after all, John said, when Jesus was coming to be baptized, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But when we look at John's ministry, when, when, Zach, when we look at the prophecy about John, when Zechariah is told that John is going to come, we are told that, 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 that um, he will be a symbol of God's winnowing fork. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what, God, that's what John expected. 
When he said the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he was expecting the Lion of Judah. He was not really expecting Jesus the Lamb. His expectation was the Lord's winnowing fork in his hand. He's got fire. He's going to tie fire to that which does not obey him. John the Baptist's ministry is less than ours because he had an incomplete view of Christmas. Now, this is an amazing thing. In, John, in Luke 7, 26 through 28, we, Jesus says that John was more. He was beyond what is anticipated and exceeded what was expected of a prophet. He actually got in the water and crowds came to him and people got baptized. Never happened before. Yes, we had sex in Israel that practiced baptism. But nothing like this for the general masses? What is, what, is he, what is this a symbol of? Jesus said, What then did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger. He's going to be a delegate sent by God to proclaim a particularly inspired communication before your, whose face? before Jesus' face. I want to share something that's really, really cool here. Later in, I mean, in Luke uh, 7, 28, Jesus says, Among those born of women, none is greater, none is more significant than John. Yet the one who is least, who has the least significance, who may, who may, have, who may seem like you have small gifts, behind the scenes gifts who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John John the Baptist did not foresee that 1 Corinthians 21 1 Corinthians uh, 5.21 would come to pass for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Bible says in John, he will go before him. But this means Jesus. John will go before Jesus in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. Whatever has a tendency to turn us from iniquity, as John's preaching and baptism encouraged us to do, will turn us to Christ as our Lord and Savior. For it's grace that leads us to repentance. We read that in Romans 2.4. Grace leads us to repentance. New American Standard says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? King James says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, 7, Corinthians 7, in the King James it says this, For godly sorrow, that's what repentance should produce, godly sorrow. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. In Acts 11, 18, all right, let, me, let me contrast something. The sorrow of the world is what we experienced with e we saw Esau do. The sorrow of the world could be considered what Cain did. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh Lord, don't send me away from here because someone's going to see me and they're going to kill me. And God puts a mark on him. Now it's interesting about Cain because if you track, if you go and unpack the names of his children, he names his children after godly names. He names his children. His children represent godly attributes. Maybe Cain repented. We don't have any indication that Esau did though when he sold his birthright for um, a, a bowl of porridge. He was sad that he lost, but you don't see genuine repentance. There's a worldly sorrow that produces death. It's going to get you nowhere. Acts 11.18, the New Living Translation says this. 
When the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Acts 11.18 Grace is what leads us into the desire to be set free from the yoke of sin. To forsake the dominion that the world has over our flesh. And to take Matthew 11, 28 through 30 into our hearts. Jesus said, Upon uh, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Godly repentance relieves us of our burdens. And what does all this mean about Christmas? What about our, what about our view of Christmas? Has your view of Christmas changed over time? <coughs> when I was younger, it was all about toys. I knew it was something about this baby Jesus, but I couldn't figure that out. And I also couldn't figure out why Santa Claus. I couldn't figure out. The, I knew they were separate, but I couldn't figure it all out. Then I became a, a Christian, and Christmas took on a very, very different significance for me. I realized, wow, so important is this thing called salvation that God was going to solidify. He was going to finalize through Jesus Christ that the world divided its calendar as the demarcation that yesterday we thought these things but after him we now know these other things John the Baptist thought that when Christ comes when the Messiah comes he's gonna get even with God's enemies and that's what John the Baptist expected I think Elijah expected it too, but in Elijah's ministry, we see that um, God actually uses the heavenly host to defend Elijah. Elijah, God used Elijah to make the rain stop for three years to punish Israel under Ahab and Jezebel. Elijah oversaw the destruction of a thousand prophets of Baal or so. So yeah, one would expect if God is here, judgment's coming. You know, John the Baptist performed no miracles. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, his miracle was that God used him to, to speak and the masses came. John divides the law and the prophets and the good news. He's after the law and the prophets, but he's really before the, us un completely understanding what the real good news was about. Luke 6, can you imagine John the Baptist is faithfully following God. He is going to be beheaded and he's kind of not seeing the whole big picture. So he's a great, great, great guy. But we see the big picture. We see the whole thing. So we are actually greater than he in terms of the impact we should have in people's hearts. Luke 16, 16, and the law of the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces, eagerly pursues, positively asserts and presses his way into it. You hear the message of Jesus Christ and you mention to someone, I was talking to this guy about the Bible and the, and the, the, and the people around you say, what well, the Bible? Come on, you can't be listening to that. Don't tell me you're going back to that church and listening to that. You got to press your way into it. You got to press past those negatives. We can only press as the word press literally means that God has fired you up to do so. Grace has burst a flame into your heart and you know it's true and I'm going. I'm coming. Forcing is done by through the inward persuasion of the Holy Spirit that compels us to act upon the revelation of Jesus Christ, what it means to our personal lives. 
You notice John never tells people to go back and show yourself to the priest. He never says, hey, Leviticus says, and you got to go do these things. He never points the people back to the ceremonial law. He points them forward to something that he didn't even really quite understand himself. It's almost like an Abrahamic type call. Abraham is a great man of obedience because he followed God. But in Genesis 12, 1, God tells Abraham to follow him. But the reason Abraham is a great man of faith is because of Genesis eleven thirty, four words. And Sarah was barren. Abraham is a great man of obedience because he went, but he is a great man of faith because he took his barren wife with him. John the Baptist knew something was up. He calls people to personally uh, participate in God's righteousness by repenting as one humanly, as possible as, as, as possible as one humanly can do. Repent as possibly as one human can do, as a human can do. You know, repentance is your responsibility. Yes, I ask the Holy Spirit all the time, Lord, work in me so I repent. If you don't work in me, I'm not going to repent. But that's my responsibility. My responsibility is to position myself so I am yielding to the, the working of the Holy Spirit to bring me to repentance. I can be stiff-necked, and at times I am. Really? Eh. Yeah, you know, I, I know another pastor. <laughs> I know a guy. He calls, John calls the people to personally participate in God's righteousness by repenting, and he says, and producing fruits that are consistent with repentance. If you repented, I should be able to see some outcomes in your life. John was right about some, some things. Judgment is coming, and he's a good watchman. John is an excellent watchman. Judgment is coming. But before then, there's going to be Christmas. And God's going to send Christ to redeem us. Ezekiel 33, 6 says this, But if the watchmen, those appointed and anointed, to lean forward and peer into the distance and be an advanced observer of what God is going to do. I hope I gave you that definition in your notes. Yes, I did. Lean into this thing. See what's going on. You see the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people? He is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins. But I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. I had a guy at work one day who said to me, Oh man, I had some Jehovah Witnesses knock on my door. I'm glad, hits me on the shoulder, I'm glad you're not like those people. And the Holy Spirit came upon me and I said, I'm ashamed of myself. He said, why? I said, because I believe you're going to hell. And I won't knock on your door because I don't want to offend you. I believe that this room that we are in right now, there's other people now are starting to listen to us. I said, I believe this room that we are in right now, if you could see through the eyes of eternity, you will see that it is on fire with the fire of hell. And I won't knock on your door. I'm ashamed of myself. That man came to Christ two weeks later. Second Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 explains the battleground between biblical truth and worldly philosophies. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We got people giving us thoughts all the time on Facebook now. Text messages. Luke 3, 4-6, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, this is John's ministry, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight, make his path straight. <coughs> Whose path is he making straight? Uh-uh. The Lord's. But he does it through us. Here's how it works. 
Luke 3, 4 through 6 means that as we preach God's law to people, they can see where their hearts and their lifestyles are crooked, where they have sunk into the valleys of low living, below God's standards, and how far they have walked crookedly away from God's straight and narrow Ten Commandments. And this becomes the basis of their repentance, so they open their hearts to God. This is how the law, this is the work of the law that Galatians 3.24 talks about being a tutor or a schoolmaster, a boy's guardian who has charge of their life and morals. That prepares the way of the Lord by making people open and repentant so God can make a straight path into their hearts. Do I need to repeat that? We preach the law to people, which convinces them that they are sinners. And they say, oh my gosh, I'm in the valley. I'm not up where God wants me. I'm falling short. I've been walking this crooked path away from God. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Lord, help me. I open up. Now the way is straight for God to come in. Woe to the church that says we should not be preaching the law. We don't have to preach the ceremonial law, but there is a moral law. It's a code that is written on our hearts, it says in Romans. And you have to respond appropriately to the law and acknowledge that we, Christmas is not going to mean anything to you until you understand your, your relationship to God under the law. What are our roles and responsibility as disciples? To not be ashamed of the gospel. I've come to the conclusion that a lot of people, if you really press them, they're really ashamed of the gospel. The good news is that you're a wicked sinner. You deserve all the pit of hell and the wrath of God upon you. But you don't have to get that. Because God sent Christ. Making any sense? The wages of sin are, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't think John saw that. John said, as, his, as his, John said in, uh, in uh, Luke 3, 4 through 17, verses 7 through 9, he said, Therefore, when the crowds came to be baptized, he called them a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John was expect, John's expected wrath. You're going to get it. He says, bear fruit in keeping, in keeping with repentance. In verses 10 to 11, to the crowds, John said, share your food and clothing. Whoever has two tunics, uh, share with him who has none. Whoever has food, do likewise. In uh, John, and I'm sorry, in uh, Luke three eleven, I'm sorry, Luke three twelve through thirteen, John told the tax collectors who came to be baptized. Right, they're going to make this demarcation. We're going to, we know we're sinners. We got to do something here. He said, collect no more than you are authorized. To the soldiers in verse fourteen, he said, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations. Don't let anybody bribe you and go beating up on other people so you can make more money. Be content with your wages. This is the beginning of fundamental societal change. This is the beginning of what we came, come, will come to know as Western civilization. Those, those soldiers are no longer going to be able to go back to Herod. And Herod tell them, you go to Bethlehem and kill a bunch of innocent kids. They're going to say, no, I'm not doing that. As the people were in expectation, all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them saying, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. You know, the barn is really, a, it's all a symbol of our hearts. There's wheat and chaff in our hearts. John is expecting that there's going to be, you know, you're, you're the wheat, you're the chaff, we're going to burn you all up. So when the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared. Did we? Did we uh, well, you started reading that. Yeah. Okay. They, here we are. They declared and acknowledged that God is just. They were convicted to confirm, to conform to His proper standard. 
church, we got to preach the law. We got to preach God's moral commandments to people. Otherwise, there is no Christmas for them. They're just left in their delusion. They're left believing, as John says in one of these passages of scriptures, don't say in your hearts that you are children of Abraham, that biologically and because you got this ceremonial law and you keep these rules and you do this penance and whatnot and you say, uh, Hail Mary's and our fathers, that you're going to get right with God. That's not going to work. Or if you belong to other, any of these other religions that are going to have you do some sort of ritual to make yourself right in God's sight. John, John expected, let's move on, John expected judgment. He didn't foresee, 1 Corinthians 5, 21, that the Lamb would mean that Christmas ultimately means that God would put the sins of the world on Christ. So God would impute to us, ascribe to us, and count us as righteous in His sight. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets, they, they saw it foreshadowed. They got, fore, they got shadowy glimpses of it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I could go around this room and I know that some of us have had a very, very hard time coming up to this Christmas season. But if God is going to do this, if He's going to put our sins on Christ, make us righteous in His sight, we have to trust Him for this. We have to trust that this is true. Lord God, birth, rebirth this hope in our hearts. Because we know that you've done this for us. And because you are such a great and awesome and mighty God, we're going to trust you for this. That's our hope. But you know what? Even if I don't get that, I'm in, man. I mean, from the, from after this, it's, it's all uphill, really, from here. You got those? I got one more for you. I believe. Christmas means that God would put the sins of the world on Christ and would impute to us His righteousness, which means God counts us as being righteous in His sight because Christ bore the punishment for our sins. John didn't see that. He's an amazing, great guy because he did what God called him to do, but he couldn't quite figure it out. Romans 4, 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sins. That's really an Old Testament sentiment. They kind of got foreshadows of it. We get the realization. The Old Testament spoke of it. Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And in Psalm 85, 2, thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. You can see this is kind of a King James day, right? Jesus is the Messiah, born on Christmas morn to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Faithful disciples. Call wise men to still seek him. I was doing a funeral the other day. The funeral director says to me, do you want to ride in the, uh, with the, in the hearse? I said, is that standard? <laughs> is that something I should do? He goes, well, you can take your own car. And I, I went, to, went to the bathroom, and in the bathroom, the Holy Spirit said, get in that limo. I had a divine appointment with the limo driver. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. The young man was in college, hearing all sorts of things about our government. And he's come to the realization, what government needs is a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for giving us the privilege of going to tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. We pray that you would birth Christmas in our hearts, fresh and new, 
so that we have a message, we have an unction to tell the world. Use us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,